Uh, thank you so much for coming here. A lot of you drove a long way. Some of you actually went through hard times. I know that my church people did, but uh, you're here. That's important. You're here. If you're here, you might as well, whatever you're worried about or what problems you had back there, just put it aside, trust the Lord, and you know, enjoy a good time. Enjoy a good time, and maybe the Lord can give you something where you can carry on through the week for you or maybe change your life. Amen? Amen. All right, speaking of life-changing, it's not going to be that type of message, but it is kind of a life-changing thing we're going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about time traveling, all right? All right what a way, all right. So, <laughs> welcome, <laughs> welcome to the warm-up to the blowout. What we usually do is that I do a very deep Bible study. I know a lot of people, they uh, enjoy that. So, I, for the warm-up, I'll give a very deep Bible study. After that, we'll do Q&A. And then the blowout begins where you get the preaching, where you can get some things right with the Lord. All right, but here, you guys came here for the teaching part, so I'm going to give you the teaching. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, there's a lot of goodies here that's going to show a lot of interesting things about the Word of God. It will also support creationism in debunking evolution. Amen. And also, believe it or not, it will be very helpful with your rightly dividing concept with biblical hermeneutics. Sometimes with very deep doctrine, you'd be surprised there could be those nuggets in there that can be actually practical, believe it or not. There can sometimes be something practical. Now, obviously, we should not always give deep doctrine. The Bible talks about at Hebrews where you just get so infatuated with meats, and then because of that, you lose your growth, your balance. When you feed babies, you don't give them meat. You give them milk. Well, then how do they end up in meat? It becomes natural with so much milk. See that? When you feed them a lot of milk, and then they naturally grow and takes time, meat just sucks in naturally. But, you know, when you just start off with meat, and then all of this goes over your head, then it can choke your Christian walk, actually. So I, when I started my ministry, I was going through two and a half years of basic doctrines, actually. Then after that, I did uh, a little bit of verse by verse with a little bit of soul winning tactics. And then later on, I did dispensationalism. Then I did the crazy stuff. And for some weird reason, that's when I became popular. <laughs> All right, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Today we'll be talking about time traveling. I do believe that this is very possible. Actually, a lot of scientists are talking about it as well. That it can be possible. The only problem, though, is that they don't have the ingredients to do it. Well, with our God, it's not a problem for Him to do it. Amen. He's the one that created all the particles and the ingredients yeah. to begin with and put those things in motion. Now, this will be very eye-opening. It's going to start off with some biblical hermeneutics, and it might open your eyes. First of all is 2 Peter chapter 3, and we'll start off at verse 8. One thing you must understand, the first thing we'll talk about is time perception. Two people you have to keep in mind here that will be very eye-opening as you read the Scriptures. When you read the Bible, sometimes it's very confusing, and sometimes God's timeline is not our timeline. That's very important to understand. So two people you have to look at is God and man. And when you read that scriptural text, you have to see how it goes with God, and then it goes with man. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 is very plain, and let me know when I'm out of bounds. The Bible says, But beloved, uh, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, notice how God's time frame is different from our time frame. Basically, what you might think as one day could be a thousand years to God. Yeah. And then what seems like a thousand years to you could be one day to God. And that is very true. We're going to look at Exodus 3, Exodus chapter 3. And then I want you to go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Exodus 3, Revelation 2. Now we're going to look at a lot of scriptures. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures. But we won't be turning every one of them for time's sake. 
So I will give you verses at times that you can write down. And like I said before, you have to look at the verse yourself and check if I'm right or wrong. Okay? The reason why, this is the easy answer why God's time frame is different from ours. He is always present. He is omnipresent. Time does not dictate God. He is not bound by time. He is I am that I am. So in other words, whatever is going on in your time frame that may be the past, God still says I am that I am. And then whatever is future to you, God still says I am that I am. But man is bound, dictated by time. And because of that, he can go from past to present to future. Now let's look at Exodus chapter 3. Notice that that's how God addresses himself. And look at, look at verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. What did he say? Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am. I am the one who is the one that sent you. Look at Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2. Now, before I read these verses... When you read scriptures, sometimes when God speaks in the past tense, it's something that will take place in the future. So one passage you can write down is Isaiah 53. We won't turn there, Isaiah 53. The Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Why Isaiah is preaching during the BCs that Jesus already died for our sins. But he was talking about something in the future. Why? Because God, look at this, he's the time traveler. So no matter what time period you're in, he's always present. So that's God's perception of time. So he already sees his son dying and everything. So that's why he can say he was bruised for our transgressions. He was wounded for our, that's good. He was wounded. Now look at Revelation chapter 2. Look at verse 12, verse 12. And to the angel of the church of, in Pergamos write, These things saith he which, has, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. So notice that John is writing to seven churches, and he's writing during his timeline, during the early centuries, to the church in Pergamos. So God is speaking to the early church, uh, the early church of Pergamos in the early centuries. But look at some of the verses here. This doesn't seem to happen during the first centuries of the church of Pergamos. If you keep reading at verse 16, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. What's he talking about here? He's talking about those people of wrong doctrine that the church of Pergamos is uh, combining themselves with at verse 14 and 15. And God wants him to repent, or what? He's going to fight them with the sword out of his mouth. Why? That never happened during the first centuries of the church. When did God fight against people who are of wrong doctrine of apostasy with the sword of his mouth? That's Armageddon in the future, where he slays them. Huh. Look at verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. Why uh, to those who overcome God will give them a new name, uh, uh, hidden manna. Why Christians, you already have your names written in heaven. You already have a new name. But these people have to overcome to receive the new name and a hidden manna. Why, that's obviously not the first centuries of the Christian church then. It's not talking about us Christians. It's talking about a future time period. Even though he speaks to churches at verse 17, right? Isn't that interesting? What's going on here? So we see that he's addressing to church or churches in Pergamos, first centuries. But then we see future time period in his language that he's speaking here. What's going on? He's going double time periods. Yeah. Wow. Does God do that? Of course he does that. That's all throughout the scriptures. Psalm especially. All those prophecies about Jesus Christ in the book of Psalm. But David a lot of times was writing about himself. What's going on? He jumps. When he's saying something, it can go to two different time periods. God is quite a time traveler because he is I am that I am. 
So in the present tense, when he is speaking, he can speak it all that at the present tense. But to us, it can be two different time periods. See, so you have to understand the time perception here. How God perceives times is different, is different from how we perceive time. Now go to Psalm 102. Psalm 102, as well as 2 Kings 20. 2 Kings 20. So go to Psalm 102, and then I also want you to go to 2 Kings chapter 20. Scientists, there's one thing they don't understand as they study physics and the laws of the universe. They don't, they don't understand why time always go forward. You know, why doesn't it go to a different direction? Why is it always forward? And the reason why it goes forward, some suppose, is because the second law of thermodynamics. Now, what is the second law of thermodynamics? The second law of thermodynamics is an unbreakable scientific law. It helps a lot with our creationist arguments. Second law of thermodynamics demand that all of the universe, they break apart. So, in other words, the universe does not evolve into a better and better and better, more uh, better or more complicated universe. It breaks apart. That's what second law of thermodynamics demands. It's the law of entropy. Everything runs down. So because things have to run down, that's why time has to go forward. Why? Because things have to break apart. It can't just stay the same. See, it has to break apart. So that's the second law of thermodynamics. So scientists have talked about that traveling back in time is actually harder than traveling forward in time. If you want to jump to the future, that is scientifically easier than going to the past. Well, it's not a problem with God. He created second law of thermodynamics. That's why. Yeah. So go to Psalm 102 and verse 25. Uh, look how great our God is. Just want to brag about my Lord. Amen. Verse 25, Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment as a vesture. Shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. See, the universe runs down. All right? It goes forward. But look at God, verse 27, But thou art the what? I am that I am. See, he can control time. He's the one that puts it, everything into place. Now look at 2 Kings 20. 2 Kings 20. Can God turn back the clock? Not a problem. Look at 2 Kings chapter 20. It's, it's a piece of cake to the Lord. He can let, the, let time go backwards a bit. 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse 10. Verse 10. And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. Nay, but let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. So during the old days, they had a dial, okay? And when the sunlight hit that dial, then by the shadow, they can tell what time it would be. And King Hezekiah said, well, if it goes uh, 10 degrees forward, everyone's used to seeing that. I like to see it go backwards. Not a problem, verse 11. And Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward. Yeah. See, God can turn back the clock. Yeah. Not a problem with him. Uh, I want you to look at Hebrews 1, Hebrews 1, and 2 Timothy 3. I want you to look at Hebrews 1 and 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, do you recall another passage where in the book of Joshua, sun stand still, and then uh, the Lord just lets it sit there. He's not worried about time and all the universe falling into chaos. God's like, no, no, just, just stay over there. <laughs> And the scientists flow up, uh, pull up a fit, and they're like, what happened? And God's like, I'm, I happened. That's what happened. <laughs> but because they refuse to believe in a God, that's why they have to find out what exactly happened. It's just unexplainable. Uh, do you recall at the book of Haggai, the Bible says that he's going to do it again. The sun and everything will stand still. See, God's, uh, he has no problem to handle time. Why? I am yeah. that I am. I change the universe uh, I change not, God says, but the universe changes. Uh, I want you to look at Hebrews 1. Now, this is going to be very helpful in dispensationalism and rightly dividing that you want to hear. When God gives verses about man's time period, you can't just think that, 
when God gives a certain day, certain time, that it's going to be addressed to mankind in a general, understandable way. No. What you have to understand about God is this. When he says a specific time period, dispensationalism, the problem with people is, especially hypers, is they only look at time period. But that's not what dispensationalism is. It's not just the right t time period. It's the right group of people. Now, when God gives a time period to this one group, it's not going to be the same as when he says it to the other group. A great example, so actually it splits to two parts. It's Jews and the church. That's what you need to know. So when God talks about, for example, last days at Hebrews chapter 1, look at right he here, Hebrews chapter 1. Your hand's already there, so I'm going to be reading it. In verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Okay, so the author here says we are in the last days. But look at the author of 2 Timothy. Now keep your hand at Hebrews. We're going to go back and forth so that you can understand. Look at 2 Timothy 3 in verse 1. Verse 1. This know also that in the last days, okay, last days, perilous times, what? Shall. Shall. Future. Come. Okay, the author saying last days is future, but then the other author says we are in it right now. Now, if you want to be lazy and be a covenant theologian or Calvinist, and you can pretend you're smart, but you're really not, it's just you're really lazy, you can apply everything that it was fulfilled at the first centuries. So when you talk about end times, prop, prop, prophetical stuff, they will all apply it to the first centuries. Why? Because these authors are writing as if they are in the end times, or it's already undergoing, or it's been fulfilled. But the reason why they still are amateurs, they are not scholars of the Bible, they're amateurs, is because they don't understand rightly dividing. When God speaks here, let's use common sense. Forget rightly dividing, let's use common sense. Who is the author speaking to in the book of Hebrews? Oh, Jews. Okay, now here's another one. Look at the church. At 2 Timothy 3, who is he speaking to? The church. So when God says last days to Jews, it's different from the last days of the church. Now this is very important. When you hear, hear the language that God uses about uh, end times or uh, eschato uh, eschatological language and prophetic language, you have to see who is he speaking to. And then you got to watch out. That may not apply to the same time period as you. For, that's why when people see a rapture in the Bible, oh, yeah. Come on. and they see it at the end of the tribulation, they assume the church will be raptured after the tribulation. But who is he speaking to? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Matthew 24, Amen. the Jews. Yeah. Right. But then the church talks about their rapture. Uh, they have a separate rapture. Yeah. Here's another example. God talks about day of Christ, day of the Lord. Yeah. When you look at that, a lot of people combine the two, but no, they're different. Right. You'll notice day of Christ is more of Paul's language. Yeah. And who is he a writer to? The church. And then when the Bible talks a lot about day of the Lord in the Old Testament, for example, those are for Jews. Now, this will be very eye-opening in your Bible study. If you understand that, this is called time perception. If you want to know what time period you're at or how the Bible's operating, you need to see the group of people. That's good. That's good. If you just look at time period, yeah. then you're going to wrongly divide stuff. It's not just the time period. It's also the group of people. Now, uh, how do I know that, well, how do you not know that it's the same thing? Well, one, he's talking to different groups of people. One, the addressee. But the second thing is, notice that it doesn't work with last days of the Jews and with the last days of the church. For example, compare the Jews with Job 14 and Luke 21. Job 14 and Luke 21. 
Now, this is a favorite passage used by post-tribbers or people who attack the pre-tribulation rapture. They love Job 14. And I have to admit, it's my favorite passage to, to support pre-trib rapture. Amen. You know what's really funny that I find with these post-tribbers? A lot of the verses they use as proof text, and my members know this, a lot of times I'll point them in the same chapter or even in the same verse that is supported a pre-trib argument or a dispensational argument. Amen. They just don't read. Yeah. They just don't read, okay? All right, look at Job 14. Look at Job 14. Favorite passage for post-trivers. They will mention that you cannot rapture until you go past the tribulation, they'll say. So look at Job 14. Uh, Verse 12, so man lieth down and riseth not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. Ah, so you don't resurrect until the heavens be no more. So that's definitely after the tribulation or the tribulation timeline. So then they have a rapture or a resurrection sometime during the tribulation. Okay, but look at this part. This is the wild part. See, I told you. No, no, no. Verse 13, O oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret until when? Thy wrath, Thy wrath be past, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. Okay, so he doesn't resurrect until the wrath is past. Okay, so then the Jews have to go through the wrath then, and that is an appointed time. You notice that? God set up a time period. Yeah, that's good. Now, some of you who already know the Bible already know my answer, but I'll just keep talking. Okay. So, he appointed a time that the Jews are going to go through the wrath, and then they get raptured or resurrected. Now, here's another one. Look at Luke 21. There's no doubt about it. They're going through wrath. Look at Luke 21. Luke 21. And then verse 21, post-trivers, and a lot of people know that this is talking about a tribulation reference. So this passage is about the tribulation. Look at verse 21. Uh, then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst uh, of, the, of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. So that's the tribulation, but... They didn't read verse 22. For these be the days of what? Vengeance. Vengeance. Look at verse 23. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and what? Wrath, Wrath upon this people. So, that tribulation passage, they didn't pay attention. That's a time period of wrath that God appointed. Okay, why is that important? Because you're not appointed for wrath. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. Your appointment is not wrath. Can I repeat that again? Your appointment is not wrath. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. And God literally worded, yes, appointed, okay? Just like Job, you know, that my appointment is past the wrath. But then right here, the church, they're not appointed for wrath. So see, there's a, there's a different appointment that we're undergoing. See that? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to what? Wrath. Wrath. Oh, by the way, this is the favorite passage of post-trivers who are anti-Semites. 1 Thessalonians 2, but they should have paid attention. That, that verse would have proved Jews are appointed for the wrath. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, same passage. They weren't paying attention. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 15. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men. See, those are Jews. So let's be anti-Semitic. Look at verse 16. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins always for the what? Wrath. Wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Oh, they, they didn't read. Yeah. They didn't read. <laughs> now notice right here, that's why we... Know for a fact the last days for Jews is different from how God's going to give last days to the church. It's like when God talks about forever for the church, for saved people, it's going to be different from the forever for lost people. It's the, it's the same thing you have to understand. 
If you understand this, it will be incredibly eye-opening and helpful. Uh, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 5 and Romans 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And then we're going to look at Romans 2. Now, the question in people's mind, and this always bothered me, is if Christians go up, so I don't know if you knew this, but I'll just give a brief review. A lot of you would know this. When the tribulation occurs, uh, whether it be 7, 10, 3 and a half, 40, I've heard different numbers, all right? <laughs> yeah, I know. But anyways, well, however long the timeline of the tribulation is, the point is this. The point is, the judgment seat of Christ, God has to go through everybody's life. Now, how long will that take? While we're being judged at the judgment seat of Christ, the tribulation is a shorter time frame. So how are we going to go through that judgment seat of Christ real fast? Unless God's plane of time is different from man's plane of time during the tribulation. But let me give something that's really scientific. It's called time perception. Time perception. This is very interesting. The mind, a lot of uh, people would talk about, it comes from the soul. Now, when you go up at the judgment seat of Christ, you're at your soul function then. So then the mind starts functioning. The soul starts to operate in its full capacity. Believe it or not, the mind, or, the mind can go slow or fast depending on the amount of memorable experiences. So, for example, there are people who talk, uh, there are people who talk about if they were to look at a clock passing by, then it goes really slow for you. Why? Because you're focusing so much on that mental image. But then when people age older, time goes by very fast. Why is that compared to kids? Because kids, they think one at a time, and then their mental concentration is that one thing, so it goes very slowly. Whereas for grown adults, especially city people, hustle and bustle, it just goes by pretty fast. Why? It's not as memorable or the experience is not that strong where all your mental state is focusing. The point is your brain power, see? The mind power. When it's focused so much on that one image, it slows down. Time slows down a lot. Now this is why it's incredibly eye-opening. If you look at Romans 2 and 2 Corinthians 5, what kind of mind do we have? Remember, when we die and go to heaven, we have the mind of what? Okay, if the church is going to have the mind of Christ, then think about this. Our mind will be stronger than Google. <laughs> now, if you type down, it's, it's amazing. You can search up a person's life or record, all their information by just one click in 0.5 seconds from Google. But your mind is more powerful than that one. And when God shows your whole life, he can just do it just like that. And he can do probably 100 people at the same time like that. But then to us, it can be a lifetime. Why? Because our mind is stronger. So because our mind power is stronger, every detail that God has to judge you for, that mental picture will be, will be completely focused on that when God judges it. That's why you can go through a whole lifetime just like that. I mean, think about the limited capabilities of our body where people talk about life review from near-death experiences. Your whole life just goes like that. If our flesh can do that in limited capabilities, imagine the soul with its full-blown functions of the mind with the mind of Jesus Christ. That makes sense. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. The emotion that really stirs up the slowness of time, especially in near-death experiences, is fear. So look at this, 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing, see, there's your mind at work, therefore the what? Terror, terror of the Lord. So then with that terror, God says, what did you do for me? And then boom. Now look at Romans 2, Romans 2. Isn't this interesting? Verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, 
and their thoughts, see that? Their mind is at work here. The meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. You give an account, your mind, on every detail that you did for the Lord at the judgment, verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. See, your thoughts will be at play at the judgment. That's why it can make a lot of sense. So as much as I uh, love the idea about the judgment seat of Christ going like this, it may not be that way when you experience it. It could be a whole lifetime. It can go very slow. That's something to think about. All right. So for time-traveling teaching, you got some kind of conviction. <laughs> you got a little preaching maybe. <laughs> This is even uh, given in articles from the University of Southern Maine. The title of their article is, How Does Time Stop? And if you look at that uh, article, uh, actually, it's not that article, sorry. It's a different article. It's from Live Science. The title of the article is, Why Time Seems to Slow Down in Emergencies. And it supports that. All the things that I've given to you, the scientific details, how the mind functions, where time slow downs, it's all documented in that article. Okay, now, he, if you think that was fun, here we go. Here's a deeper one. Time dilation. All right, time dilation. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 1. This is fun. Look at Genesis 1. Genesis chapter 1. All right, I have my science geek here. Uh, it, did I pronounce that right, brother? Time dilation? Is that right? Okay, all right, just making sure, all right. Got to ask the guy who had the free ride to Berkeley, you know. Yeah. So. <laughs> all right, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 4 and 5. You know, scientists and physicists have talked about that time can be changed or traveled or manipulated. But you know what are the two objects that can manipulate it? Darkness and light. Darkness and light. Now, what I mean by darkness is not just generally darkness, obviously. So, I do not believe in this, but I'm going to give our scientists the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to give the evolutionists so much benefit of the doubt that in return I'm going to stab them and show them it supports the Bible more. Okay? So then they talk about gravity creating the uh, whole universe itself or black holes. Or they'll talk about how light, the speed of light, that with light as well as gravity, it can change time. That's what they believe. So then when light goes so fast, that's why with that speed going on, the clock can just go like this. So it can go faster because the contents and people are all particles or everything surrounding it. So then when that motion of speed just goes like that, then, then it affects all the universe around them. So then that's what uh, physicists will teach or talk about. And then they claim that gravity and light can do that. Traveling back in time, though, you can see would be a hard feat. You can talk about going like this with the speed of light, but what about backwards? Yeah. So then they go to, to La La Land, talking about wormholes and stuff like that. But let's give them the benefit of the doubt, okay? So basically, they have to talk about these dark objects or light objects. Now, if you, these articles are supported by the University of Southern Maine. How does time stop? They go by Einstein's uh, relativity. And then also you can look it at uh, science, uh, abc.com. The title of their article is Time Dilation. Why does gravity slow down the flow of time? So, gra so with gravity and light, you can speed or you can slow down some things. Now, uh, that's not a problem with the Lord. The Lord already told you that time was it. He, he showed you about time having its system with light and darkness. Genesis 1. Genesis 1. Uh, verse 4. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. See how time goes? And the evening and the morning were the what? First day. Look at that. Time for mankind can begin. And God already showed you the ingredients of light and darkness, how he did it. Well, how are you going to get that 
you need some operator to get it going. You can't just let things go on by itself. How are you going to do that? Unless you get an intelligent designer. That's right. Unless you get God. See, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, this is even more interesting. Uh, look at Genesis chapter 1, verse Genesis 1 and John 1. Genesis 1 and John 1. Let me say even more than this. We believe that God, when he created the universe, he spoke it into existence. He just speaks it into existence. Now, if you study string theory, where they go that really far back, they tell you this. All particles, all right, gravity has vibrations, actually. And gravity is supposedly responsible for the creation of our universe, says Stephen Hawking. Well, uh, you always have to go back. Where'd that come from? Where'd that come from and all that? So then when they go deeper and deeper about the vibrations within gravity, then they find these strings, they call it. But then these strings, they said, are like vibrations. So then it vibrates. Now think about this. When God created the universe, he spoke it into existence. Yeah, I know where the vibrations come from. Let there be light. Boom. That's where you get it. You need the word spoken. That's why I look at this in John chap uh, Genesis chapter 1, and then look at verse 2, uh, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Oh, I would like to add another thing. You know how light, uh, how you can create light? You can use it through vibrations. When you put vibrations into the water, light, believe it or not, can come out. Light can come out, believe it or not. So then, what does God do? He just speaks it through the waters. That's why there were waters at verse 2. Why did the Bible say the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters? He's going to begin something. At the waters, let there be light, and boom, light had to come out. That's proven at the Science Explorer, and the title of their article is, uh, This is How Sound is Turned into light. So they're concentrating sound vibrations over here. So there are many different types of vibrations. But the point is, is that some sort of vibration you can put into there, into the water, light can come out. Isn't that fascinating about our Lord? But look at John chapter 1, John 1. Now keep your hand at Genesis 1. I, I want to go back and forth. Uh, you can get your hand out of all the other places in the Bible. Just keep it at John 1 and Genesis 1. Now, John 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the what? Word. Word, that's something spoken. Why does God call himself the spoken word? Because, look at verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the what? Light, light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the yeah. darkness comprehended it not. The word was in play to create the whole world and to give off light. You want to know where gravity comes from? Why? You need to look at these verses. Look at uh, Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1. Keep your hand at Genesis 1. You can get your hand out of John 1. But keep your hand at Genesis 1. Go to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1. You know where... Uh, gravity comes from. This is the passage where it talks about the entire universe holding itself together. And the physicists and scientists don't understand why it's able to do that, but it just happens. So then they call it gravity. I'll tell you. Look at your Bible. <laughs> That's it. Look at, your, look at your Bible. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and what? Upholding all things. That means to consist it, hold it all together. By the what? Word, Word of his power. Amen. That's what keeps it going. So then that's why you got that force or that power within gravity. Why? God can just uh, speak into it, and they say gravity has those vibrations. Where did it come from? You know, where did it come from? Now, why don't you become a saved uh, Christian after that, huh? 
every evolutionist who tries to support their evolution theory, they'll be soon surprised that in the BCs, some guy who was uneducated already wrote about that in the Bible. Let's look at uh, uh, Genesis 1, verse 2. The article that would support it about where people believe about gravity and vibrations and then string theory, you can look it at PBS, their website, and they use actually NOVA. And from NOVA's article, uh, they talk about string theory. So if you type that one down into it, then you should see that article. It's actually very fascinating about our universe. Now, when we look at Genesis verse 1, 2, 3, and 5, here's the thing that's also interesting. Black holes, they cannot produce light. That's what scientists say. Now, I'm not saying I believe it or I teach it, but I'm just going by the evolutionist benefit of the doubt and then turn it against them, okay? So they say that black holes cannot produce light, but when light goes near contact with it, not direct contact, but near contact with it, what happens is further light can shine throughout the dark universe. So then uh, when light starts to uh, go into this uh, black hole, but not directly, but kind of like near it, with this black hole, that force going on, then it's, can, it can hit somewhere nearby it within its proximity, and then with this, it just shines it out more. See that? That's the idea, how it works in physics and with the laws of the universe. Now think about it. Who is, the, who is the one giving it vibrations or the word, and who is the word and who is light? God said, let there be light, and there was light all over throughout the darkness. How are you going to do that? Why? Look at this. God is light. He speaks it, and then here goes your little black hole, and then he can even do a light out of that, and then here goes the light, do, 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 do. bam, yeah. let there be light. Amen. How about that? How about that? Uh, the Bible is something else. Look, I mean, out of darkness, you get light. Look at this, Genesis 1, 2. And the earth was without form and void. See that? Void? It kind of gives like a black hole language almost. Maybe it affected the earth or something. I don't know. But continuing on, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. See that? And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. See, God is over there in that darkness and waters. He's about to do something. He speaks to it. God said, let there be light hitting the darkness and bam! Man, that book is something else. Now let's look. Uh, you ever thought about this? This is interesting. Why do you think God who is the Word. Now, we don't have the Word with us, His actual presence, but look at this. Follow me now. Uh, I have to look at my notes here, okay? That way I can speak this right. But think about this. Why do you think God put His words in a black book with black letters to produce light? Isn't that something? It's a, co it's, a, it's a coincidence, right? A coincidence with your book. Deuteronomy 5. Now, these verses seem to make a little bit more sense now. Look at Deuteronomy 5 and Proverbs 1. Deuteronomy 5, Proverbs 1. Deuteronomy 5 and Proverbs 1. Now, these verses seem to make sense then. Look at Deuteronomy 5. Look how the word is connected or hits something that's black. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 22. The Bible says, These words, right, the Lord spake unto all of your assembly in the mount out of the midst of fire of the cloud and of the what? Thick, dark. thick, nar thick darkness with a great voice. So he speaks into it and bam! Here's another one. Look at Proverbs 1. Now, isn't it interesting how the Proverbs word this as? Look at Proverbs 1, verse 6. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their what? Dark, Dark sayings. 
Why do people want to connect something black when you're talking about words here? Where did that come from? We could put pink, you know. I'm sure that our communities here would love that. I'm sure our communities would love that here. But why is it black? Why are your letters black? Why are the words, look at your letters, they're black. One in the world. And then what? <laughs> the irony, it gives light to you. The Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know what's going on? God up in heaven. When you're reading that book, God up in heaven. Boom right here at the black. And then boom right here, you get light. Oh! What a God! Yeah! Feel free to run around the room. <laughs> All right, here's another one. I want you to go to John 18. John chapter 18, John chapter 18. There is so much material here, but I don't think we'll have time to go through all the verses, so I'll just have to uh, bypass some of them. There's a lot of good stuff here. Uh, go to John 18. Here's another one. You ever thought about uh, when Jesus, he said, I am, what happened to those people? Yeah. They fell backwards. Now, wh what's going on with that? Because... His word is in a different time zone. When God, Jesus was speaking, was he in a different time zone when he's saying that? Yeah, he's not saying, you know, uh, I am here in the man's time sense. No, he knew exactly what he was saying. He was using God's omnipresence language, his time. I am. Now think about it. When his time zone, I am, collides with mankind's time zone that differs, what would happen? You ever thought about what would happen? Well, uh, this is interesting from live science, and they said this. If the, because we know speed of light, because it's so fast, the speed of light, it can manipulate time. But people are asking, what if sound vibration, sound vibration was as fast as the speed of light? And those soldiers, they heard Jesus speaking to them, sound from him, I am. What if that speed of sound was just as fast as the speed of light that can manipulate time then? Then what would happen? They say in Live Science, the title of the article is, What if the speed of sound were as fast as the speed of light? They mention here that it would have such an effect that you would fly backwards pretty much. It says, a molecule traveling at the speed of light would have nearly infinite energy. It would blast through every particle it encountered, if you have an encounter with it, sending electrons flying, I am, <gasps> and producing a spray uh, matter and antimatter, particles generated in ultra high speed collisions that have properties opposite to those of matter. Ain't that something? Look at John 18. Yeah, glory to God. Verse 5. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. How about that? Amen. Yeah, I, I, uh, I believe in those italicized words in the King yeah. James Bible. Yeah. Those translators italicized he for a reason. Yeah. Why? Because italicized words are not in the original. Well, look at that then. Woo, I am. <laughs> Blows you back, man. Blows you back. Now, uh, this would make sense with a lot of different things. If we were to think about, I want you to go to John 14, John 14 and 2 Corinthians 5. We have to look at this, otherwise you're not going to believe me. You're going to think I'm crazy. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and then we're going to look at uh, John 14, John 14. Now, there's several things we can learn about time dilation here. When Jesus says in Revelation 22:20. 20, if you want to write it down, that's fine. Revelation 22, 20. Behold, I come quickly. We respond, yes, even so come, Lord Jesus. Hey, it's been 2,000 years. <laughs> you know why? Because the reason why is Jesus' is time in heaven, because he's light. And you know what they said, said about the speed of light when you're in it? Time is slower for you. 
in those articles that I've given you the sources. So while the world goes fast and time flies, you, everything is just still in the moment. It goes slow. So then if heaven is all light, then when Jesus goes up there, a, uh, a thousand years to you guys is like one day to me, he says up here. And that can explain why. And if you, uh, if you don't believe me, you can read 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 4 and 8 through 9. You know what that verse says? People are mocking. Where is the promise of his coming? Because he's delaying. But you know what God says after that? He says, don't be ignorant of that. A day with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day to him. And then the very next verse after he says that is, the Lord is not slack concerning what? The promise. What promise of his coming? Amen. See, told you so. Just look at the verses. Okay, anyways, I can't, I don't have time for that. Look at John 14. I got another, I got a bunch of crazy stuff here, so I got to go through all this quickly. So uh, John chapter 14, verse 2. And then the Bible says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Okay, so when Jesus went, went to heaven, then he went back to heaven, why? To prepare us a place, right? Okay, when he's preparing us a place, this is interesting, keep reading, it says, uh, and if I go and prepare a place for you, so in other words, when he's done preparing that place for us, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Then he's going to rapture us. All right, follow along with me. So, when, so then the rapture is supposed to happen when our home in heaven is finished. But look at 2 Corinthians 5. This seems strange. Brother Robert was there when we kind of talked about it. I was talking with uh, Dr. David Walker, Pastor Stevenson, and Pastor Gorski, and then we, it came up this wild stuff about time, which was very interesting. But then as I study, it made more sense to me. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. What did the Bible says about our home in heaven? Verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. So it's automatically prepared for us if we were to die. Look at verse uh, 6. Therefore we are always confident knowing that whilst, whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Verse 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Okay, there's no doubt about it. As soon as you uh, die in the body, the verse is saying you're automatically up in heaven with God and you automatically uh, have a home in heaven. Okay, wait a minute. So you have your home finished immediately after you die. But then John 14 says you immediately have a home then you get raptured. Well, which one's right and wrong? Well, think about it. Now, this is an important theory. What if after you die, immediately that is when the rapture takes place and then everyone goes up to heaven together? Why is that? Because on God's time frame and the man's time frame, it's going so fast for man. So, so many things happening, but God is so slow. Things are going on in heaven. So then, basically, immediately after you die, the rapture would have happened. Why? Because God's time frame is different from our time frame. That is, so then, uh, when I discussed that with the pastors, I was like, oh, that would be crazy if that's the case. But it made a lot of sense to me because why? 2 Corinthians 5, John 14, you have that dilemma. It says the home is finished. When? Immediately after you die, 2 Corinthians 5. But John 14 says, no, when the home is immediately finished, he'll come for us. That's why it'll make sense to Jesus that he can come quickly. Why? It's like two days or a couple hours for him up there. Whereas for us, it's been 2,000 years and so many people have died. But God controls time, so he can make it just go boom like that. So remember that theory, okay, that immediately after you die then, Immediately after you die, then the end times can start launching and hitting, okay? If, so I put this as a theory, all right? This is not a doctrine, all right? Thank God. <laughs> so this is just a theory. But if you are open to this theory, this is going to make sense about some other stuff. So remember this. We'll come back to this.
go to, uh, now let's talk about the time travelers. That's what you want to hear. All right, now uh, let's go John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We'll shorten our Q&A because I don't want to go through this too quick, uh, but I'm going to try to rush it as much as I can so that you can understand, all right? All right, go to John 6 and verse 19. John 6, verse 19 through 21. Are there time, is there time traveling in the Bible? Four cases. Four cases, I see. John chapter 6, verse 19. So when they had rode about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship. As soon as Jesus, he was walking in the middle of that sea, stepped on their ship, what happened? And immediately the ship was at the land, whither they went. What happened? Boom! It just switched all of a sudden. Why? Jesus has the power. Time traveling. He sped up time. Jesus, sped, uh, Jesus slowed down time for the disciples when he was with them, and he says, be not afraid, but all around them, it just went so fast. Boom, like that. Is that possible? Well, light speeds things, right? All right. Was, did Jesus have light? I think so. Look at John chapter 6, and then uh, look at verse 17 and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now what? Dark. And Jesus was not come to them. But then what happened? At verse 19, they see Jesus in the dark. How do you do that in a storm in the dark unless he has some light around him? What if Jesus was that light? And maybe that's why that light can just hover on the water. But anyway, 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 food for thought, okay. John 21. That would make a lot more sense. That would make a lot more sense why he can walk on it. Go to John 21. John 21. All right, you want to write this verse down. While you're turning to John 21, you want to write down Revelation 1.10. Revelation 1.10. John time traveled. When he was shown all the future and the end times, Revelation 1.10 says, I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day. Well, how do you know he was seeing Jesus' coming in the future? Why was he present there? Because Jesus said so, that he would live till he saw that. How would he live till he saw that? See, there's that, it's the same thing like after you die immediately, the rapture happens. There's that conflict. Jesus does something where he manipulates that time. Look at Revelation, uh, uh, look at John 21, verse 22. What did Jesus say? Verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? So that's about John. Jesus says that he's going to live till I come. That's crazy. What, what happened? God switched up that time period for him, where he jumped him. He traveled forward in time. Paul did the impossible. 2 Corinthians 12. This is the goody one. 2 Corinthians 12. You ever wondered why he said things that were not lawful? Lawful to utter? Unless, unless, here's the thing. Can we agree that when he died, he immediately went to heaven? Yeah, okay, he immediately went to heaven. Think about this. Wh remember what I told you? What if that theory is true that immediately after you die, the rapture already happened and you're up in heaven and you're seeing all that end times unfold? So then Paul's like, whoa! And all the things that God prepared in heaven for the end times and everything, Paul sees all of that and it's just happening and then God says, okay, you got to go back to your body. It would make sense why Paul wants to kill himself. <laughs> so then, what if when Paul sees all of that, the future, and maybe even Revelation 21, 22, and God prepared everything in heaven, God says, okay, you have to go back to your body. That means he has to travel back in time. And that's why back to the future, they will say stuff like, 
When you go back to your past, don't say this kind of stuff about the future. It's not lawful to utter because all the universe would just go. Maybe that would make sense why Paul can't do that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such an one caught up to the third heaven. Verse 4, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. He did the impossible where scientists talked about wormholes and it's going to be a lot of work when you travel back in time. Not to God. He controls time. I am that I am. Daniel 7. Daniel 7. Last person, believe it or not, is Satan and his minions. Now, they cannot control time fully, but they can try to dabble with it. The evidence is found where uh, today's unbelieving physicists even Sean Carroll, who actually very intelligent, he won, uh, I think he won his debate against William Lane Craig. So this guy was very intelligent that he was able to debate that. But he even, a smart guy like him, talked about, yes, we can travel through time. Even a guy like him was saying that. And then you can find that uh, at his video, which is uh, <clears throat> from the National Geographic, How to Time Travel. And these... See, human scientists are talking about how to dabble with time. And then CERN obviously was underway with that. And the title of this video, believe it or not, it's from CNBC International. And the title of their video is Creating Black Holes and the God Particle. So CERN was even dabbling into that. And when they dabble with black holes and stuff like that, obviously, They'll dabble with things that, uh, with the laws of physics and particles about time here and there. They'll bump across that subject. So see, mankind was already doing that. Satan, is he, he wiser than them? So he's not God. But what he could do is try to find something within the laws of the universe where he can try to dabble with it. Is it possible? Look at Daniel 7, verse 25. The Antichrist. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand a time and times and the dividing of time. Look at that. So the devil is given opportunity to do what he thinks to dabble with time. Now this is very interesting. I never understood uh, Revelation 17 and chapter 18 where it talks about the ten demoniacs, that they have one hour with the beast. Revelation 18, they talk about the advanced city Babylon, that it's only one hour. Well, what if this is the case? And this would make a lot of sense. Currently, scientists are already dabbling with time right now. They're trying to do that. All right, When they have Satan, he will do that. Daniel 7 says so. During that time, what helps them do that? It's called advancement of science and technology. Now, this is a no-brainer, but in Science Alert, people who are living in an advanced scientific uh, technological platform, especially if your mind gets hooked onto internet and you put that thing on your brains or something like that and the goggle and then dabble with it, you know what they say about those people? Time speeds up to our brain's perception. What if the, when the devil's trying to dabble with time and advance that technology and science and the people who live in it, that advanced Babylon city, that great city they call it, it was only for one hour to them. Oh, wow, yeah. And then the ten demoniacs, it says they have one mind. One mind. There's like a technological hive there. Or one mental perception thing going on. So then because of that, then the Bible says in reality what comes out to those people is like uh, one hour. One hour. There's an advancement of technology that to these people who are affected by it, they call it one hour. One hour. The title of the article is Science Says That Technology Is Speeding Up Our Brain's Perception of Time. 
And that's what happens. And that's why you got to watch out for your next generations when they dabble with that technological stuff, that internet stuff. It seems to go really fast for them. And that's actually very dangerous. So, but the devil, he dabbles with time. So there you go, time traveling. All right. Wow, Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray tonight's teaching have been a blessing to the hearers and bless the Q&A that we're going to have after this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.